have been providing access to books, knowledge, and learning. And I'm echoing back there on the Zoom. <laughs> this is fun. We're all learning together as we do the live stream programs um, and hybrid programs. We have been learning together. We have been community together. Like the early founders of the Athenaeum, we have dreamed about what it means to be a vibrant city together. And so we have opportunities to come together, whether it's over books or ideas, history and people, and learn and engage together. Even though we don't have our receptions following right now, we still have our hearts and our minds, and we invite you after our program to stay, to buy the books, to look in the reading room at the exhibit of Sarah Josepha Hale um, items that are in our collection that connect to uh, this talk tonight, to share with one another. What are you doing over the holidays? What's the best book you've read this year? If you have a top five list, Share it with me, because we are compiling those. Tonight, uh, as, as we learn about Sarah Josepha Hale, and as we prepare for Thanksgiving, which was a holiday which was so important to her, um, I can't help thinking about the work that she did with all the presidents, including with Abraham Lincoln calling for the institution of a national holiday, that, that we're in a time when we can think about how we become a more perfect union how we stick together in times of conflict and strife, which were things that both of them worked toward. And so I think it's only fitting that we have Melanie Kirkpatrick here tonight to share with us um, on her new biography. And I just wanted to point out too, when you go to the back afterwards, Headhouse Books with Carly, you can buy the biography, which is fantastic. And you can also buy Melanie's book, Thanksgiving, The Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience. And this is a fun little one. If you're going on a long car ride and someone else is driving, you're traveling, you want to bring something to whoever is hosting Thanksgiving, this is a great little book to bring. So I want to introduce to you tonight our speaker. We're so so glad to have you here, Melanie. Melanie Kirkpatrick is a writer journalist with a long history at the Wall Street Journal uh, who is based in Connecticut, and she's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, which is a Washington think tank looking at foreign policy. She contributes reviews and commentary to various publications and is the author of not only the book which is the topic tonight, Lady Editor Sarah Josepha Hale and the Making of the Modern American Woman and Thanksgiving, the Holiday at the Heart of the American Experience, but also Escape from North Korea, the Untold Story of Asia's Underground Railroad. And we're so thrilled to have you here tonight along with your husband, uh, your, your children, your granddaughter. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. I invite all of you to join me in warmly welcoming Melanie Kirkpatrick to the Academy of Philadelphia. Thank you, Beth, for that warm introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you here and on Zoom for joining us. It's, uh, uh, I have um, been longing to come to and see this beautiful building ever since I began my research into Sarah Hale and discovered that the Athenaeum of Philadelphia has the best collection of her correspondence. So thank you too, uh, uh, Beth and others, for uh, the wonderful letters that of, her, of her and to her that I learned so much from. I'd also like to give a special thank you uh, to my granddaughter, Grace David, who was here uh, this evening, along with her mother, Sarah Green, and another grandmother, uh, Julie Williams Green. All three of them led me on a memorable tour of Sarah Josepha Hale sites in Philadelphia when I was doing my research, and I really appreciated it. I had a sense to uh, get a, a vision of the environment in which she operated, and I, the thing that really surprised me was how close together everything was. You know, Godey's Ladies Book, um, I, I had uh, none of the original buildings in which uh, Godey's Ladies Book was published uh, still exist, but um, there, I had a whole list of addresses all on Chestnut Street. They just kept moving uh, up Chestnut Street, and uh, that was kind of fun to see as well. So, 
My guess is that uh, the name Sarah Josepha Hale isn't familiar to most of you, but if you've heard of her, and since you're Philadelphians, uh, many of you, some of you may have, it's probably as the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb or as the godmother of our Thanksgiving holiday. While Hale was one of the most influential women of the 19th century, she's all but forgotten in ours. When she died in 1879 at the age of 90, in an era when the um, uh, average age of death for a woman was around 40. Um, when she died at the age of 90, after editing the magazine Godey's Ladies Book for 50 years, her passing was widely noticed in the press. A Boston newspaper lauded her as, quote, an earnest worker in the cause of woman's advancement. The Times of Philadelphia described her as, quote, one of the busiest women this country has ever produced. While the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote that, quote, she did much to dignify women's work. Harper's Bazaar, a competitor of Godey's Ladies Book, eulogized her as the, quote, pioneer woman editor. In a lengthy tribute that began on the front page, it described the events that Hale had witnessed during her life and the writers with whom she had worked. It was like hobnobbing with the last century, Harper's Bazaar wrote. Indeed, Hale was born in 1788, the year before George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States. And she died when the 19th president was uh, in office. As it happened, two years before Hale's death, that very president, Rutherford B. Hayes, wrote Hale a letter from the White House addressed in his own hand um, and praising her as, quote, a lady who has accomplished so much for the peace and happiness of the American people. Sarah Josepha Hale, nay Buell, was born in 1788 on a farm in the village of Newport, New Hampshire. She was the daughter of a Revolutionary War veteran and a mother who believed that her daughters should be as well educated as her sons. Mrs. Buell put that belief into action when she homeschooled Sarah and her siblings. In the late 18th and early 19th century America, no college admitted women. So when Hale's brother Horatio went off to Dartmouth, Sarah could not go too. Such was the value that the Buell family put on education, however, and such was the force of Hale's education, uh, intelligence and intellectual curiosity that Horatio set out to teach her everything he had learned at Dartmouth. I like to think that she received the benefit of a Dartmouth education 175 years before the college opened its doors to women. Hale's education continued when she married a lawyer, David Hale, who had moved to Newport from a nearby town. Every evening after supper, David and Sarah would sit together for two hours at the sitting room table where they read the classics, examined the prose style of the great English writers, and studied French, botany, mineralogy, geology, and more. When David contracted pneumonia and died suddenly in 1822, Sarah was left nearly penniless, with four young children under the age of seven, and one more on the way. She was determined to find a way to support her family and educate her children in the way that she and David had dreamed. One of the few occupations open to women of the day was needlework, and the Freemasons of Newport, of which David had been a member, set her up in a millinery shop in the premises of his old law office. She hated it. Trimming hats was not in her line. <clears throat> Before David's death, she had published a few poems in local publications, and she now set out to make some money as a writer. The Freemasons paid for the publication of her first book, a volume of poetry, which is on display in the next room, by the way. Several magazines in Buffalo, in uh, Boston, also published her poems. Um, under pseudonyms. 
But her big breakthrough came with her anti-slavery novel, Northwood, published in 1827. Northwood was a literary success. It received favorable reviews, including from the eminent poet William Cullen Bryant, and it was published in London, a rare honor for an American book. The novel caught the attention of a man in Boston who was starting up a serious magazine for women. He wrote to Hale out of the blue, offering her the position as founding editor. And so, a few months shy of her 40th birthday, in January 1828, Hale became the editor of the Ladies' Magazine, embarking on an editorial career that would last for half a century. Under Hale's editorship, the Ladies' Magazine became the first successful magazine for women. It was so successful that Louis Godey, owner of a Philadelphia-based magazine called The Ladies' Book, tried to lure her to Philadelphia to edit his publication. As part of his campaign to do so, he even published a, a poem by her young son, 14-year-old son, trying to uh, get her to think that this might be a good guy to go work for. But she refused his offer. And when she did, when he did, when she did so, Godey purchased the ladies' magazine so that he could retain her as editor of the combined periodical. Thus was born a great partnership that created one of the first national magazines in the United States. When Hale took over as editor of the ladies' book in 1837, its circulation was 10,000. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, circulation had grown to 150,000 with a pass-along rate that made the readership far, far larger, and at least one scholar has estimated that it was around one million. To give you a sense of how extraordinary uh, the ladies' book circulation was, consider that the average circulation of a magazine of the era was 7,000. That's the short history of how Hale got into journalism, and I will focus the rest of my remarks on what she accomplished with her work. The range of her interests and accomplishments was enormous. She wrote about and offered opinions of just about every topic of special interest to women. Three years ago, when I embarked on my research for the book that became Lady Editor, I knew that she was editor of Godey's Ladies Book, the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb, and the godmother of our Thanksgiving holiday. But I didn't know how extensive and var varied were the roles she played and the accomplishments of which she could take credit. Who was Sarah Josepha Hale? Let me offer five answers. Number one, she was an author. According to the Yale Bibliography of American Literature, Hale wrote, edited, or contributed to an astonishing 129 books. That's in addition to the millions of words, and I mean that literally, that she wrote for her magazines over 50 years. She was incredibly versatile, and she wrote in many genres, poetry, short stories, novels, prose, children's literature, cookbooks, advice books, religious books, plays. But the book that she considered her masterwork was Woman's Record, a 900-page compendium of the biographies of 2,500 distinguished women from the creation to A.D. 1854, as the subtitle rather immodestly put it. It was an immense undertaking and a serious work of scholarship, requiring three years of research into biblical studies, world history, classical literature, and much more. Woman's record holds the distinction of being the first volume of history to put women at the center of its research. As such, it is a distinguished forerunner of a school of academic discipline William, women's studies that didn't emerge until the mid middle of the 20th century. Hale sent copies of women's records to many eminent women, including First Lady Sarah Polk, the Queens of Spain and Portugal, and England's Queen Victoria. She reached Victoria through future President James Buchanan, who at the time was about to go to London to take up his post as the American ambassador there. 
It's a measure of Hale's self-confidence that she requested such a favor. And it's a measure of the high esteem in which Hale was held that Buchanan acceded to her request and carried her book with him to London. Perhaps most amazing of all, the queen replied to Hale through her secretary. Her majesty was very much gratified, he wrote, by receiving Mrs. Hale's book. Let me note on this point that I would love to ask the American ambassador to the UK to give Queen Elizabeth a copy of Lady Editor, <laughs> but I don't have Hale's chutzpah. <laughs> you can see a copy of Woman's Record also in the reading room uh, on display there. Number two, Hale was a patriot. Hale brought a deeply patriotic sentiment to her magazines. She believed that while, while the 13 former colonies had won their war for independence, they would not be truly unified until the new nation developed its own separate cultural identity. She set out to make that happen through her choice of what to publish. She announced that she would publish content by American authors writing on American <laughs> themes. From the perspective of the 21st century, this may seem an obvious aim. Surely, Americans want to read about their country and their countrymen and countrywomen. But it was a radical idea in an era when an American identity was just being formulated. It also was a radical idea in the publishing industry, where many periodicals were cut and paste jobs compiled by so-called scissors editors who clipped articles from British or other publications and republished them without credit in their, usually, in their own publications. Hale, in contrast, sought original homegrown material. The bylines that appeared in her magazines represented the best of America's emerging literary talent, the young Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, William Cullen Bryant, John Gre Greenleaf Whittier, and more. Hale also sought out talented women to write for her, and many female authors got their start in her magazines or built or enhanced their reputations there. Among them were the young Harriet Beecher Stowe, the prolific poet Lydia Sigourney, and Frances Hodgson Burnett, author of The Secret Garden, which um, I imagine every woman in this room has read when she was 10 or 11. And Gracie, it is up to you to read The Secret Garden soon. You already read it. Well, OK. Um, Hale's all-American formula for her magazine helped to shape a common American aesthetic, creating a mass culture not just in literature, but also in food, art, music, etiquette, fashion, and much more. Readers in every corner of the expanding nation were learning what it meant to eat like an American, dress like an American, behave like an American. They were quoting the same poetry, cooking the same recipes, and sewing the same fashions. Number three, Hale was an educator. Before her marriage, Hale spent several years as a teacher at a school that she opened for young children in Newport. The school still stands, though it is now a private residence. It's possible that Miss Buell's school was the site of a little lamb that followed a girl named Mary to school one day and inspired Hale to write her famous poem. Hale began her editorial work in 1828, as I mentioned, when half of American women were illiterate. And as I said earlier, there wasn't a single institution of higher education that admitted women. She often said that education for women was the paramount mission of her magazines. For 50 years, every issue of the Ladies Magazine and Godey's Ladies Book reported on and advocated for women's education. One of her early campaigns was on behalf of women as teachers. This but the prevailing view of the day which was that women lacked the intelligence and moral stature to be successful teachers, except of very young children. 
Hale believed that the two sexes had equal intellectual capabilities, but lacked equal educational opportunities. A correctly educated woman could teach any subject as well as an educated man. Quote, there is no branch of learning taught in our common schools which females would not be capable of teaching, she wrote. Her advocacy helped change Americans' attitudes about women's roles overall, but especially about their suitability for the classroom. And when I checked in September with the Department of Education's website, I learned that 76% of the teachers between the grades K through 12 are female. So I, I, Hale was successful in that regard. Having run a successful school before her marriage, not to mention her experience as the mother of five, Hale developed strong ideas about how to teach. She believed that children learned best when they developed at their own pace, and that self-instruction guided by a teacher was the most effective way to absorb knowledge. Good teachers helped pupils learn how to learn. She believed, too, that young children learned best when they were entertained, that is, with music or lively stories that held their attention. Hale put her beliefs into action in her writing for children. Her juvenile poetry and short stories were a departure from the moral didactism that characterized most writing for children until the early 19th century. Rather, they were child-centered and provided an engaging blend of entertainment and moral instruction. They almost always carried a message or provided some factual information, but they also engaged the imagination. The now forgotten third verse of Mary Had a Little Lamb exhorts children to be kind to animals. Hale's writings on behalf of female teachers was just one of the many areas she pursued on the subject of women and education. A strong advocate of early childhood education, she started in Boston what is sometimes called the first kindergarten in the US. She founded the first daycare center for working women. She created the term domestic science and urged the creation of schools of home economics as a way to professionalize the work of women who worked in the home. She urged readers to study chemistry, biology, geology, physics, and other sciences, subjects that were typically considered too taxing for the female intellect. She encouraged women to become doctors and supported the um, effort of Elizabeth Blackwell, the first doctor, female woman to receive a medical degree. She published reading lists and self-study advice for readers who wished to extend their knowledge and improve their minds. She pushed for public funding of institutions of higher education for women. She supported vocational training for women to learn specific skills, such as nursing or needlework. Her magazines were the go-to source for learning about new schools for women, about educational philosophy, teaching techniques, innovative educators, and more. In her old age, she campaigned for women to play larger lay roles in Protestant churches as medical missionaries and as deaconesses, non-ordained women who worked as teachers and social workers. One final example to add to this already long list. In the 1860s, as a close advisor to Matthew Vassar on the founding of the all-female Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, she lobbied for the appointment of women to the faculty, rebutting the trustees' skepticism that qualified women existed. She put forward the moral argument that an all-male faculty would send a discouraging message to scholarly undergraduates that they would be unfit to teach at their own college after completing their studies. When Vassar College opened its doors in 1865, two of the eight professors were women. Of the 35 assistant teachers, 30 were women. Number four, Hale was a style setter. There is no better example of Hale's sway as the preeminent cultural influencer of her day 
than two traditions she introduced to her readers in the 1840s that continue to flourish today. They are the white wedding dress and the Christmas tree. Both reflected her respect for Queen Victoria, whom she held up as a moral exemplar for American women. The Christmas tree caught on in America after she published an engraving from a London newspaper of the Queen and her family gathered round a Christmas tree at Windsor Castle. She Americanized the graving, engraving by removing Prince Albert's mustache. She loathed whiskers, which she called whiskeroos. <laughs> and uh, she made the Queen's uh, tiara also disappear. Her changes, call them a 19th century version of photoshopping, transformed the picture into a cheerful domestic scene of an anonymous family gathered together to celebrate the, the holiday. The white wedding gown was inspired by Victoria's wedding dress for her 1840 marriage to Prince Albert. Hale made it an exception to her usual avoidance of writing about fashion and described Victoria's white satin gown in close detail. The ladies book went on to publish many items about and drawings of women dressed in bridal white. And by 1850, Hale wrote that the white wedding gown was, quote, an emblem of the innocence and purity of girlhood. Let me add a word about fashion here. Godey's ladies book was famous for its hand-colored fashion plates, which employed numerous women in early WFH jobs, that is, work, work from home jobs. Readers admired them so much that they would tear them out of the magazines, frame them, and display them on the walls of their homes. These plates are still readily available on eBay and other auction sites, and someone in this audience might well have seen one at your grandmother's house when you were a child. Yet Hale, in a word, loathed fashion, which she thought encouraged avarice and vanity and was a waste of time and money. Just as she wanted to cultivate an American literary culture, she wanted to encourage an American style of dress. Quote, are we always to be indebted to Paris and London for our mode of dress? She asked her readers. Shall we never be fashionably independent? Republicans in costume as well as character. For Hale, neatness and simplicity were the hallmarks of the appropriate American style of dress. <coughs> Excuse me. She raged against heels that were too high, dresses that were too flimsy for winter weather, and corsets that were laced too tightly. She lamented the craze for unnaturally small waists. One might fairly inquire how Hale got away with such apostasy as editor of the women's magazine that was the template for Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and every fashion ma magazine that came after Godey's Ladies Book. The fashion plates in Godey's Ladies Book were an important aspect of its success. They were one reason the Ladies Book was the most popular magazine of the pre-war period. The answer is that Mr. Godey was a smart businessman. He understood that Hale's editorial services were very valuable, an essential ingredient to his magazine's success. He was willing to put up with her anti-fashion views. The fifth and final aspect of Hale's work that I wish to mention is Thanksgiving, of which she is often called the godmother. Hale adored Thanksgiving. In her 1827 novel, Northwood, um, she writes about what we'd call a classic New England Thanksgiving celebration. And I think it's the best such description of, uh, found anywhere in American literature. In her words, Thanksgiving dinner featured, quote, pies of every name and description known in Yankee land, with the pumpkin pie occupying the most distinguished niche. I included an excerpt from this description of Thanksgiving in the back of Lady Editor, along with other examples of her writings. 
Before 1863, when President Lincoln heeded Hale's call and named a national Thanksgiving Day, the date of the holiday was left up to the governors, who didn't coordinate and sometimes didn't even name a Thanksgiving Day. The holiday took place any time between September and December. There was an amusing saying that if you planned your itinerary, travel itinerary carefully, you could enjoy a Thanksgiving dinner every week between Election Day and Christmas Day. <laughs> That's a lot of turkey. Uh, Hale saw Thanksgiving in part as a patriotic holiday, along with the 4th of July and Washington's birthday, two national holidays that were born of the American experience. She also saw Thanksgiving with his emphasis on family reunions and a special meal as falling into the feminine sphere. The holiday re reflected, too, what she saw as the generous spirit of the American people. As the country moved toward civil war, she hoped that a national celebration would help, would ha help preserve the Union. As she editorialized in the ladies' book in 1857, Quote, such social rejoicings tend to greatly expand the generous feelings of our nature and strengthen the bond of union that finds us brothers and sisters in that true sympathy of American patriotism. There were two aspects of her campaign for a national Thanksgiving Day. First, she used the pages of Godey's Ladies Book to create public support for her idea. Second, she carried out a private letter writing campaign, lobbying presidents, governors, congressmen, and other influential Americans across the country. It's a measure of the stature she occupied in American society that many of her correspondents, including several presidents of the United States, took the trouble to write back to her. After Lincoln's death, she didn't claim victory and halt her Thanksgiving campaign. She successfully urged Presidents Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, and Rutherford B. Hayes to follow Lincoln's example. By the time of her death in 1879, the tradition of a national Thanksgiving Day was well established. It did not become official, however, until 1941, when Congress passed a resolution naming the fourth Thursday of November as Thanksgiving Day, and President Franklin Roosevelt signed it into law. Writer, patriot, educator, style setter, and godmother of Thanksgiving. Hale was all these things. If you had asked her, however, what was her most important role in life, I believe her answer would have been something different. I think she would have responded, I am a mother. For all the work she did to open doors for women, she believed that motherhood was a woman's highest calling, and she urged that, important, that the important work women did in the home earned them a higher status than society accorded them. Hale, in my view, was a foundational figure in the women's rights movement that followed. Some of her beliefs, such as her anti-suffrage views and her opinions about somewhat separate spheres of activity for men and women, show her to be, as we all are, a person of her time. Today, those views are rightly seen as archaic. On other important women's issues, however, education, paid work, property rights. She was a radical, a woman ahead of her time. Hale's idea about women's special obligation to family, their moral leadership, and how they could live useful lives remain relevant today. They are worth considering, learning from, and adapting to a modern Senate setting in which men and women are accepted as equals. Hale used her magazines to change the national conversation about women's roles, responsibilities, and power. I wrote Lady Editor for the purpose of illuminating the extent of her influence, which hasn't, in my view, been sufficiently appreciated. She deserves her due as one of the most consequential figures in the narrative of American women's struggle for equality. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat>
with one question before we open it up for everybody. I think we've all heard about the many amazing things and important, uh, important, important uh, ways that she was an activist and a leader in her time. Why don't more people know more about Hale? Why has her legacy sort of been forgotten? Well, I think there are three reasons. Uh, the first and probably most prominent is that she was uh, against suffrage for women. And um, remember, she was a woman of the 18th century who lived to be very old. Uh, uh, you know, and when the suffrage uh, campaign really took off after the Civil War, a majority of American women opposed it. Hale um, opposed it for an interesting reason. She thought politics was a dirty business. And who can argue with that? <laughs> but uh, she said, she also thought that women were of a higher moral order than men. And that women could be more effective if they didn't vote, if they didn't get into the dirty uh, rough and tumble, you know, down there making compromises. Instead, she wanted them to uh, keep their eye on the, the um, moral implications of political considerations and uh, advise the men in their lives about how to vote. She thought this would be a, a, a more effective way. Second, um, Godey's Ladies Book, which had uh, begun to change kind of in the last few years of her life. It was not as uh, serious as it had been. And then after her death, uh, it really became pretty trivial. And I think that she was uh, wrongly associated with um, that uh, aspect of Godey's Ladies Book instead of looking back at what she had done earlier in her career, especially education. You know, memories are short, and uh, at, when she died at the age of 90, there weren't a lot of people around uh, who would have remembered what she did. And finally, and here I'm speaking as a former lady editor myself, I don't think people fully appreciate the role of an editor. And, uh, you know, she had uh, control of what into the magazine, but she shaped what went into it in a very powerful way, imposing her ideas on the magazine. And uh, so, you know, some of the people sh who wrote for her uh, became famous, justly so. But uh, and she was famous in her own day. But I, I just think she sh uh, that, that was one reason that uh, affected her, the people's appreciation for her today. Anybody else with a question? Yes. Glad you touched on her, on her views towards suffrage. Uh, and that, that it was, she was a, she came out of a crucible of a period when she was born. At the same time, I've done some research on her, a former guy at Royal Cemetery. Ah. And she would, she knew how to use political methods and did. She was a very powerful woman who wailed and dealed. And so she was very powerful politically. And yet she still had this kind of the, the, the moral higher sphere, even though in her own way she was doing as much wailing and dealing as. Yes, the question is, um, uh, the lady points out that uh, Hale was a real wheeler dealer politically. She knew how to um, get um, uh, you know, bills passed, I, I would say, uh, by Congress, and she, was, she knew how to um, manipulate the system to her ends. Well, that's certainly true, but, um, and she was uh, influential in um, the uh, the passage of the Morrill Act, uh, the, is that how you pronounce it? M O R R I L L, which established uh, land grant colleges. Yeah, and uh, she was very much in favor of that, and was extremely disappointed when the le legislation did not um, uh, require that the colleges admit women. Um, but uh, sh I I'm sure in 
uh, her work to get, um, for example, states to get rid of their um, coverture laws, meaning that a married woman had to um, uh, hand over her economic rights to her husband. She thought she was doing the right thing. It was on a, a moral plane in, from, you know, in that, that sense. Um, yes? Um, the question is, did she have any opinions on the treatment of Native peoples? I don't recall her um, writing too specifically about it, like about the Trail of Tears or anything, but she um, was very um, interested in Native American culture and um, would publish articles about Native American culture and thought that there was a lot that we could learn from that. Her oldest son, uh, um, who um, graduated from Harvard, um, he was in uh, Thoreau's class and he was, uh, he was number one in his class. I don't know what Thoreau's ranking was, but became an, an ethnographer and anthropologist. And um, he was inspired by, I think, her interest in native cultures to do this. And um, when he was at Harvard, uh, there were some Native Americans from, I think, Maine that camped on the campus. And he went and uh, uh, interviewed them and learned from them and then, then published, self-published a small book about their language, which, um, and he went on to write many books about uh, native languages. And he was selected, uh, before he even graduated from Harvard, to go on um, the US expedition of um, uh, Pacific nations. And they were gone for over a year visiting um, um, all the countries of the South Pacific and in Asia and coming back and uh, I, he got off the boat in Oregon and stayed there and studied native cultures, then came back to the States and wrote a big book about it. Oh, from Zoom? Yes. Do you want to read it into the microphone? So Richard, on Zoom, wondering if you could say a little bit about, uh, about Hale's role in the Bunker Hill Monument, the uh, first national monument. That yeah, we have. yeah. Well, I, I devoted, uh, I, I write about this in a, in a chapter. She was a great philanthropist. And at the time of her death, her work in uh, creating the, getting the, the Bunker Monument um, uh, erected was often mentioned because it was a very big deal in America, the first historical um, marker and from the, about the Revolutionary War. And what happened was there was a group of men that decided they wanted to, in Boston, that wanted to create, uh, um, erect a monument. And they, um, uh, over the course of a couple of years, they decided it would be an obelisk and they started work and then they ran out of money. So um, Hale stepped forward and uh, said she would ask the women of America to contribute money, and she through her magazine, and uh, she was criticized for this because saying this was a man's job, and in any case, the money belonged to the husbands, not to the wives. So she countered. She didn't give up. Um, she countered and said um, that uh, she put a limit of $1 on donations, saying that uh, every woman had, con house she could take it out of her household money, and uh, therefore it would not be uh, going against her you know, husband's wishes. And um, so she raised a lot of money, but not enough. Uh, fast forward a few years, and she came to the rescue again. The, the Bunker Hill men were about to just shut down the whole project. And uh, she said, I will organize a bazaar. And this was a, uh, in, held in Boston, but it was uh, the women of New England contributing uh, things that they had made to this great 
bazaar held in Fanel Hall, I believe, and uh, it raised more than enough money to finish the monument. Well. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It 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 really is uh, a tribute to her strength of character and her willingness to uh, also try new things. She was an intellectually, she was entrepreneurial. And um, what happened was, uh, you, you know, the the, the Hale family. Um, he was a lawyer, a successful lawyer. They had built a big house, which was known as Lawyer Hale's mansion. And uh, But when he died, they didn't have any savings. So everything had to be auctioned off. There was the, uh, you know, the hu uh, humiliation of having it announced in the newspapers that if you were owed any money, these are the three days you could come to the house and make your claim. Um, and uh, her friends, at, at the time, what widows would do, um, was they would have to live off the charity of friends and relatives because this would be true for middle class women in particular, I think, um, because there wasn't anything they could really do. Mill and, uh, needlework was the only real respectable occupation. There weren't even any women uh, whom she knew who had ever made a living as a, as a writer. She was she became one of the first. To, for the, to do that. And um, what women of the day often did was they sent their children off to different relatives. So brothers and sisters were separated and they would ask you know, an uncle to feed one kid, an aunt to feed another kid. And then when they were old enough to go to work, that's what they did. And Hale was determined not to do that. So, um, she would not have succeeded without the help of the Freemasons, who published her first book, and uh, then uh, that helped catapult her to the attention of, um, and then she wrote her novel, but it helped her get the attention of the man in Boston who was starting the magazine. And interestingly, she was roundly criticized in Newport for taking the job and saying that the magazine was going to fail, it had never succeeded before, before something like this had never succeeded, which was true. Um, and so uh, she was mocked uh, later on. There's one letter, uh, no, one newspaper article that came out after her death in which um, a young person from Newport had uh, wrote about how she was treated there. Um, and her children, she had to send the four older children to live with uh, relatives, and different relatives. And she went to um, uh, Boston with the baby, who was now four or five. Um, her oldest, who was almost seven, I think, when the, uh, David Hale died, um, uh, was the youngest um, cadet ever to be admitted to West Point. He was 14 years old. And um, uh, to your point, the woman in front here, about her having the, being able to wheel and deal, she by this time was living in Boston and had, knew a lot of people and she was able to help you know, get help in, um, uh, from people to support the boy's application to uh, West Point. Anyway, she, she made it. Yes, Jack, my husband, so it, it's going to be a tough question. Oh, yes. Yeah, she um, uh, struck a deal with Mr. Godey that she would not leave Boston in, until her, um, well, her, her number, two, number three son uh, graduated from Harvard. She felt that she wanted to be, and I think, 
Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again, Jack? Oh, yeah, okay. Right. For the first few years, she um, uh, edited the magazine from afar, sending things via stagecoach uh, and uh, rail train to Philadelphia. And um, after her uh, son graduated from Harvard, he w wasn't so smart. He graduated only second in his class. But, but um, then she moved to Boston with um, one of her, uh, to uh, Philadelphia, pardon me, with one of her daughters, and it meant actually that she missed the um, the uh, unveiling of the uh, Bunker Hill Monument, which I which because it opened after she had moved to Philadelphia, and I thought that was kind of a shame. We don't know how much she made. I, I looked through letters trying to f f figure out how much. Um, Mr. Godey paid her, and she, uh, besides whatever she got from him, she was constantly writing in those early years. I think she, you know, she really needed the money, and uh, she edited a, 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 a children's magazine in addition to her own magazine. She would send poetry to um, uh, uh, gift magaz uh, gift books, and. Uh, get contributions from them as well, for, uh, you know, payment from them as well. And we know that um, at some point, Mr. Godey gave her a bonus of, I think, $5,000, which was a, a very large sum of money in uh, the 1850s, I think it was. So um, she had that um, good fortune. Under the care of a female physician, or what led to her, her belief in women's physicians? Well, she believed that um, women, by their nature, um, would be better doctors than men, as a general rule. Remember, back then, it, it would, you know, doctors, there wasn't a lot they could do. It was uh, kind of to help people through a, a serious illness and all of that. And of course, they were effective to some extent. But um, her view was that women should be treated only by female doctors, and children also, only female doctors. And male doctors should treat men only. And uh, so this was a, um, it's kind of exemplified her idea of women's special place. She, she didn't, she was uncomfortable with the idea of women competing with men. And so it was, if, if she could find a way to um, let women do the same work, but, uh, uh, with other women, she would try to do that. Post, uh, she was big, very keen on uh, women becoming post mistresses, um, in part because they could do the job from home. So, but with doctors, she also back to that. She was instrumental in the founding of a couple of uh, medical schools for um, for women. Now, one here in Pennsylvania, I think it was called the Women's Medical College. And um, uh, and she wrote about all this again and again and again with the idea of helping t uh, the public to accept the idea of of women uh, working um, as doctors and nurses too. Nurse uh, nursing had been a to the extent that it was a profession had been a, a male profession as well. Thank you, Melanie. One reason why we always have to stop at seven is so that our authors don't give their entire book away. 
Otherwise you won't buy it, right? Because she'll have told the whole story. So the books are for sale in the back and, and you can learn more in this wonderful book. Also the book about Thanksgiving. I want to remind you also tomorrow night, come back. We have our chamber music concert tomorrow night, Icarus Percussion Duo with a special saxophonist. Um, should be lovely and fun, getting us in the spirit for Thanksgiving. Also on Monday evening, we have a special live stream performance with Opera Philadelphia. Um, singing to the organ at Old Pine Presbyterian is going to be live streamed here, nowhere else. And then a panel conversation with an organist, a composer, and conductor to talk about what it is like to sing, compose, and lead with the organ today. Um, after Thanksgiving, you come back after eating all of that Thanksgiving food for a conversation with Dr. Paul Friedman of Yale on why food matters. <laughs> I didn't even think about that when I scheduled him, that it was, you know, so, so wonderful. And on December 3rd, we'll have First Friday with some special things from our collection to come and experience and enjoy. But remember, we also have in the reading room right now um, items from our Sarah Josepha Hale collection. Much of it is also digitized, so you can go online and see it, but here you can see it for real. So there's so much to do here at the Athenaeum. We look forward to having you back, but we're so grateful you came this evening to enjoy Melanie Kirkpatrick uh, learning more about Sarah Josepha Hale. Thank, thank you so much for traveling thank here you. to be thank with you. us. And happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>